All right, I think we'll get started now. And if some people arrive late, they can just jump in as we go. So welcome everyone. Welcome to this fourth day of the Rethinking Economics Festival. Um, I recognize some names from previous sessions. Very happy to see you stuck with us. I hope you enjoyed the previous sessions you've attended. I hope you have already gotten a nice amount of food for thought. And we hope to add a layer of that with this, um, with this webinar on the economics of ecosystem services. So uh, on this uh, webinar, it will be fairly introductional. So we are welcoming uh, Steve Mediman today. Um, I am, uh, my name is Lena. I am from the Rethinking Economics branch in Uppsala in Sweden, and I study environmental sciences there. Uh, with me today is Eric as a technical assistant. He is part of the Rethinking Economics Network in Warwick in England. With us as well today is Lawrence in uh, the staff team of Roofing Economics, who really contributed to putting together all of this festival. So thank you so much. And finally, of course, we have Steve Mudiman, our speaker. Um, Steve has worked in a number of different roles in conservation, academia, and multidisciplinary consultancy. And he is now an ecology practitioner. Um, regarding the format of the session, um, so first of all, Steve will give a presentation of about 35 minutes and after which we'll directly open the floor to questions. So for your questions, we invite you to use the little Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your screen. You can see that you are very welcome to engage with each other as threads on the topic that you raise. We will only take questions to the speakers, not comments. However, you're welcome to just comment something to engage in the discussion with others. If you'd like to simply share a resource, such as a book or something you have been working on, please use the chat and leave the Q&A for the discussion. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, it's being live streamed on Facebook. Um, it will be available on Facebook until tomorrow, then taken down and put up on our website in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned on social media and emails and you'll get the information in time. Um, please be aware that uh, I'm not necessarily an expert in uh, ecosystem services. It's absolutely fine if you are, it's absolutely fine if you are not either. We will welcome all levels of question and really feel free to ask us any questions you may have. And without further ado, I will give the floor now to Steve for your presentation. Um, Thank you, Lena. I will uh, share my screen now and hopefully everybody will go to see. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's, it's lovely to be here and to be presenting um, this res uh, webinar on the economics of ecosystem services. I am fundamentally uh, a biologist. Um, my interest in biology has developed such that I wanted to start to investigate how biology and the wider world of human activity um, can interact. And that's basically where I'm coming from. So when we're talking about the economics of ecosystem services, here's a brief rundown of, of this webinar. Um, first, I'll talk about ecosystem services as a whole and how they're subdivided and classified. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about biodiversity and money, which are fundamentally the two underlying um, issues which relate to ecosystem services, biodiversity being the components of ecosystem services and money being the purpose for which they were, were derived. Um, I'll identify a few weaknesses and strengths of the system as it currently exists and then propose a new approach to a way in which we can perhaps get ecosystem services operating um, in a more functional way for everybody. Um, so, what are ecosystem services is, is the first and fundamental question. They've been developed really as a method to aid in the economic valuation of the natural environment, um, but only in terms of the benefit, the economic benefit, which communities derive from having the natural environment as it is in a, in a pristine state. It has allowed the, the environment um, to be recognised in calculating cost benefits of um, land use changes and developments. Whereas they were formally overlooked, the environment was considered to be a blank canvas upon which humanity undertook developments. Now it actually has some kind 
of, of significance in economic terms. Um, they're routinely divided into four main classes that I'll run through now for you. Um, firstly, provisioning services. These are probably the most obvious um, elements of ecosystem services. They're the material outputs from the natural environment, such as wild caught fish and game and timber, which is sourced from, from native woodlands for firewood, for construction materials, those kind of elements. They're, they're quite easily understood and, and easily assessed in economic terms because market forces operate directly on them. There is purchase and sale and trade within these, these elements of ecosystem services. Um, it's a, a point that needs making is that the most important of these natural provisioning services tend to become domesticated over time. Um, people will naturally tend to protect and, and separate something of value, such as a wild goat being protected and herded and becoming through time domesticated. So there is something of a gray area here when we're valuing um, provisioning services is to what extent does the natural, do they depend on the natural environment and to what extent can they be domesticated through time and then become part of the agricultural environment. The second service provided um, are regulating services. Now these are things which ecosystems have um, such as the ability to hold back um, heavy rains and rainwater and release it slowly as, as flood alleviation, natural flood alleviation schemes. Um, the diversity of predators and prey in a natural system will tend to prevent insects from breaking out into, into large numbers. So you tend to avoid insect plagues in natural systems. Whereas once that system becomes deteriorated, you can have crop pests in abundance. You can have um, floods, flash floods, which, which can cause damage. These kind of impacts generally only become um, part of human awareness when they break down, when natural flood alleviation ceases, when natural pest control ceases, then there's the problem. Um, the key economic element of these kind of regulating services are uh, how much would it cost to replace them and we can do that only once the system has broken down because we didn't know it was operating before that point um, so we have things such as building flood defenses um, the development of pharmaceuticals to prevent disease the development of pesticides to stop certain insects breaking out which until they have broken out you can't sort of second guess breakdowns in those kinds of ecosystem services. Um, so that's getting to the next stage of difficulty when applying economic measures. The third type, we're getting deeper into the ecosystem element now, are what are called habitat or supporting services. And, and these are services that we actually don't directly benefit fit from. They're kind of second level services such as the cycling of nutrients, um, the decay of, of natural materials releasing nutrients which allows the, the ecosystem to, to regenerate and to continue and to maintain um, providing the tangible services that we see. So it's kind of a second level um, removed from the end user. Um, and that becomes incredibly difficult to provide some kind of tangible economic value too. Um, and there's also the risk of double counting there. If you're counting the breakdown in the ecosystem service as well as the service itself, you can get into a situation where you're double counting. The last one is um, cultural services. Now these are associated with human well-being, recreation, health and tourism being some of the main elements of this. Um, these, it's worth bearing in mind when we're talking about cultural services that there are limits to the amount of human activity that an area can take. If everybody went to the same natural environment to enjoy it and to have recreation, not only would it be pretty unpleasant, but also 
the biodiversity of the area will begin to suffer deterioration. Um, and when we're talking about tourism, we need to bear in mind as well that it's not a reliable means of supporting an ecosystem. Um, at the moment, there are lots of travel restrictions around the world because of COVID-19. And this is causing serious economic problems for communities which are dependent on tourism, some of which will depend on tourism to come and visit natural areas. Um, and this makes them vulnerable to alternate land use. People still have to eat. So areas which are considered valuable for tourism, if the tourism stops, they can be change in value and perhaps become degraded or altered into other activity areas. So there are a number of weaknesses to the system that that quick rundown has, has identified. Uh, a single mechanism of valuation can't be employed for all of these ecosystem services. You can treat some of them as assets which are tangible, some of them you only identify when they break down. Some of them are hidden and obscure within the workings of the ecosystem itself. Um, and there are many instances where we simply don't have the information required to formulate a realistic valuation of, of um, these kind of internal ecosystem services. And that itself is a drawback. Um, the ecosystem tends to become a black box. Um, we don't need to know what's inside, apparently, and it's used in terms of a component of cost-benefit analysis without looking in too much detail or with too much understanding of the degree that we know the system. And the presentation of ecosystem services in this black box manner um, invites the creation of, of interventions such as government subsidies for certain things, incentives and taxation. Um, but all of that, it must be recognised, is based on incomplete information and limited understanding of, of what we're actually subsidising, what we're incentivising. We don't know the unintended consequences of these actions. Um, and it also overlooks several features of ecosystems which can offer additional perspective to how our understanding and how our relationship with the natural world can operate. I'll just run through a few of those now. Um, one thing that ecosystems don't, services doesn't consider is um, the counterpoint, which is treating an ecosystem as a consumer. Um, in terms of, there is a great deal of environmental conservation management undertaken which absorbs a fair amount of resource use in terms of time energy and materials to conserve wildlife to conserve nature without actually receiving that tangible ecosystem service in return now that's not a criticism of, of those kind of activities but it's it, it's important to recognize that sometimes we're putting effort into the natural environment as a one-way, it's a two-way thing. Um, we get things from ecosystems, but we also put a substantial amount of, of time, effort and resources into ecosystems, not necessarily with the aim of obtaining a service in return. Um, another aspect to consider is the idea of ecosystems operating as a commodity. Once something has been defined in, in, in the black box of, of ecosystem services as such, it's possible for it to be commoditized and then traded on open markets. Now this has already happened in um, the open market with, with carbon credits, where carbon credits are issued to companies and they are bought and sold on the basis that certain companies need to create more carbon than they have credits. So they buy such things from companies who have an excess. And this creates um, the potential for that happening with ecosystem services, that nations or areas with a large biodiversity um, component or a large 
value in terms of ecosystem services could in effect lease out their biodiversity value to other nations who are um, it going through the process of, of destroying their natural environment for industrialization and so on. And under the present economic system, I, I feel that would be a very difficult and dangerous um, option. Um, it could lead to the situation where the financial speculation and the financial value of markets would start to overwhelm the intrinsic value of ecosystem services. And they would become, whether a country was biodiversity rich or biodiversity poor, would depend upon the financial markets and the vagaries of the financial markets rather than the value of the ecosystems being considered. Now, there is a way around this, um, and that way is to make the commodity itself the basis for money. Um, so this idea, we need to start to talk about the nature of, of money, which we will do shortly. Um, but before that, Although not considered to be an ecosystem service itself, um, biodiversity, the, the diversity of nature, is the underlying, underlying foundation for all ecosystem services. And it may be surprising to some, some people listening to this that our knowledge of, of biodiversity is, is somewhat sketchy, to say the least. Um, I've included just down there the United Nations Convention on Bio Biological Diversity um, definition of, of biodiversity. So when it's used as a catchphrase, it's, it's worth looking at this definition and actually realizing that it includes diversity within species, between species and of ecosystems. That's an awful lot of information sitting there. And basically we don't know about it in any kind of realistic scientific terms. Um, it, it's wonderful in words, but the reality on the ground is we know a lot less than we seem to claim to do for these kind of, of components. Um, if we take species as an example, um, there are something like 1.6 million recognized species of plants, animals, fungi, which have been described by scientists um, myself included, I was fortunate enough to describe 21 species of, of tropical insect um, in one of my past, past employees. Um, but the best estimates are there are around 10 million species that we share the planet with. So somewhere on the planet, in various ecosystems, there is a reservoir of 8 million organisms about which we know absolutely nothing. So we need to understand that biodiversity is more than a catchphrase um, thrown around saying high biodiversity areas, low biodiversity areas, declining biodiversity. We need to be very careful and we need to take into account that the level of ignorance that we have of, of that topic. Um, and that raises an important question, is this lack of knowledge is it hampering our understanding of ecosystem services? And if it is, an ecosystem service is being considered a means of valuing, is this leading to distortions of economic valuations? Um, is it leading to misguided efforts of conservation and a misallocation of resources? Um, and that knowledge gap is, is the first of two major fault lines really in ecosystem services. Um, and I think there's a, a rule of thumb here for ecosystem services is the more we know about biodiversity, the better, because it will enable us to have a more comprehensive identification of ecosystem services, how they operate and what they comprise. It will give us more accurate valuations and it will also help us to find things we didn't know we needed. Um, by identifying new plants, previously unrecognized plants, fungi, animals, there's a whole wealth of pharmaceutical, chemical, behavioral, mechanical um, solutions to a range of problems that can be drawn from the natural environment. 
now I'll move on now to the other side of the the coin, as it were. Excuse the pun. Talking about money, um, this provision of a value to an ecosystem service does fundamentally require the allocation of some kind of numerical value in some form of currency, which can act as a benchmark for economic costs and benefits. And without that, ecosystem services will remain an abstract concept um, with little or no real genuine economic weight. It's kind of just a, a nice little sideline to make everybody feel green and comfortable. So this takes us on to what money is actually for and, and how it operates. There are two fundamental functions of money which are historically um, valid. The first is money as a means of exchange. And, and we all know the value of this. Um, it takes us away from barter systems. So I don't need to find somebody who wants what I'm offering in order to be able to offload what I'm offering levels out that problem of exchange and interaction and trade. And also, and importantly, historically, money has been used as a store of wealth. And the saving of money in the past has permitted capital to accumulate. And when that's happened, it's subsequently been used for future productive activities over long periods of time. This is how civilizations in the past grow and develop, is through undertaking productive activities and storing some of that. That's actually how animals survive, is by putting on body weight to survive tough times so they can continue to go forward and thrive. It's the same in economic terms. Saving is important. Now the first kinds of money um, developed were based on some form of commodity, um, iron, ingots, shells, grain, but most often precious metals became the commodity of choice for money. And they have some properties which, which make them extremely useful um, for that purpose. They're durable, they're portable, and they're sufficiently attractive and rare to be considered valuable in their own right. People desire to have these things, as you can tell in the use of gold and silver in jewellery extensively. Um, they do have some drawbacks. They're prone to theft, they can be forged, and the amount of precious metal in the money can be removed continuously to lead to debasement. So historically, these elements, these commodities tend to be deposited in secure storage. And then paper certificates were issued in lieu of the precious metals in storage. Uh, and they were used as money. So your commodity was safe and you were using a symbolic um, paper certificate, which could be taken back to the depository and the precious metal removed. There is one little glitch to this system, is that the, the issuers of, of the paper, the banks, have the ability to print more paper than they actually held commodity once it became universally accepted. And this is legitimized in the fractional reserve banking system, where more money than the underlying asset would be generated. Um, working on the principle that not everybody's going to want to come back and get all their gold at once. Um, it's a little bit of a, a shell game. But that developed into the um, issuing of paper money without any asset at all. And here's an example of that occurring. Um, in 1944, there was a, a Bretton Woods a place, there was a, a meeting, which generally an international group accepted the United States dollar as a global reserve currency. They would all peg the value of their various currencies to the United States dollar. And that in turn was pegged to the price of gold, $35 an ounce at the time. But in 1971, um, the United States temporarily closed this redeemability for gold. 
Um, it was said to be temporary, it's still operating today. So since 1971, there's been no asset forming the basis for monetary value. All currencies are fiat based, that is by decree. Um, you believe they're worth something because you're told they're worth something, not because they're at any underlying asset whatsoever. Um, and this can cause problems when trying to value something. Um, a fiat currency is generated through a demand for credit. The borrower receives the finance and the credit amount is registered by the lender. So quite literally, the money is just generated by demand. If you want to borrow money, you can borrow it. And we're seeing that a lot at the moment as governments are creating fiat currency to try and overcome the economic problems that the current lo lockdowns due to COVID-19 again have, have caused. But that fiat nature of currency makes it very, very difficult to achieve a stable valuation. As this, this, this chart shows, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Central Bank of America was founded in 1913. And if you had a dollar in 1913, the purchasing power that you, what you could have bought in 1913 for that dollar, now is only worth a few cents. The value of a dollar due to inflation has declined over time. So when we're talking about the environment, we are talking of necessity over the long term, over hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Um, and so to try and value something objectively using a fiat currency is, is rather like trying to use a piece of elastic as a tape measure. You can't get that fixed value that you need. So this is the second key element um, of, the, of a new approach really is that commodity monetary systems as opposed to fiat monetary systems, offer a better long-term valuation prospect. They're stable monetary systems. They're resistant to external influences, such as a government needing a lot of money quickly and just being able to print it. Um, they promote saving, they promote capital accumulation, and they li limit the amount of borrowing to low risk, profitable ventures. The, the level of industrialization based on speculation um, of future profits would not occur as readily under commodity money system. So industries would not industrialize with on a hope and a prayer that something good will come out of it, some profit will come out of it. And if it doesn't, oh dear, they can walk away. So here we have an alternative model that overcomes the two problems as I see it with ecosystem services as they stand at the moment, our lack of knowledge of biodiversity and the lack of the long-term stability of fiat currency. Um, what this alternative requires are, are three basic attitudes, if you will. First is the global acceptance that the environment has an economic value. And I think that is pretty much accepted generally to a certain degree now. The second one is a little more difficult. That's the recognition of biodiversity as a commodity. If we have um, a knowledge reservoir sitting there that we don't know about, we can benefit from working out what biodiversity there is in the environment. Uh, and that represents a commodity. And it is an untapped commodity and one which should have financial um, value. So the introduction of a money, the value of which includes biodiversity assets as part of its foundation, um, would take biodiversity from being something which is valued to be something which is a component of value. Um, and this requires a number of policy changes, um, a recognition of the limitations of the current fiat monetary system, particularly when valuing the environment, um, 
a recognition that the existing global debt generated through the fiat system can never really be repaid. There's too much fiat currency for us ever to work, be able to work and produce enough to be able to pay all these loans back. Um, the identification that we all globally need to respond to this. Um, the World Economic Forum uh, in 2021 is to be themed as the Great Reset, so there is some hope there. Um, and also an acceptance that a new global reserve currency should be introduced and it should be commodity based. Now, at the moment, there is a member hoping to be elected onto the board of the Federal Reserve in America called Judy Shelton, and she is an advocate of the gold standard. So she understands commodity based money. It's just understanding that it doesn't have to be gold. That's the commodity that you base the money on and we might start getting somewhere. So how would this work? Um, nations would register their biodiversity through a live ledger system, a network of computers, all keeping up to date with each other. Um, and what would happen was on this register, you would have all existing species and newly described species. Um, each registration would be a species within a particular country at a particular time. And that allocation would give you the right to produce a given amount of money. Um, one thing with the natural systems and the environment is things tend to expire. So the money would, the registration itself would expire after say 10 years. I chose 10 years because that's the generally accepted length of time if a species hasn't been recorded for 10 years it's generally considered to be extinct so registrations would need to be continually revisited continually updated um, and that's essential when you're considering environmental issues you need to know that what you're doing is maintaining the environment you don't just take the species and run as it were you consider it over the long term and the basis for allocating wealth between nations on this biodiversity backed currency would be species per species. So if you had a species which occurred in two countries, each country would get half of the amount of money. So very common species would only benefit a small amount for all the constituent countries in which it occurred, um, which you don't have to have a scale of rarity. If it's rare, if it occurs only in one nation, it becomes obviously more valuable. So how much are we talking about? Um, this is open to an awful lot of debate. On my back of the envelope calculation, in 2018, global debt was $188 trillion, according to the IMF. Now, if this debt could be repaid through describing biodiversity, that activity, and we assume there are 10 million species, each species would be worth, in effect, $18,800,000, which is a substantial quantity um, of cash. And what would be the effects of this new monetary system? It would free regions which are biodiversity rich from being dependent on funding sources from industrialized nations. They would have an endemic source of wealth they could mine their own biodiversity to create their own money. They could obtain their share of global wealth through the investigation and maintenance of the natural environment. Um, and they wouldn't be competing for industrialization. They wouldn't be fighting for industrialization, but they would have their share of wealth by acting as biodiversity stewards and generating financial wealth through that very activity. Um, the implication, implications of this system. Newly described species would offer um, a national premium of $18,800,000, according to my calculations. Um, so it's in the national interest to promote identification skills within the country. Um, it provides a system which grants the right to establish value based on the, what it had, what a nation has, as much as what it can produce. So 
this effectively gives intellectual productivity. In other words, the knowledge of biodiversity, a financial value. Um, it'll encourage movement towards economic systems, which um, give preference to the gaining of biodiversity knowledge. And it would offset pressure to develop in terms of industry, agriculture, and technology. If a nation is, is generating wealth through understanding its own intrinsic natural wealth, then pressure from outside for it to compete through industrialization declines significantly. Um, and it gives an option. Biodiversity rich nations can run debt free economies and they can use the money they create through this commodity based money for the purchase of manufactured goods, which would come from industrialized nations who have already lost, sadly speaking, coming from the UK, that's a very sad situation to be in, but lost a lot of the biodiversity that they would have had. Um, but we do have manufacturing and industrial um, capabilities. So we use what we've got and biodiversity rich nations maintain and use what they've got. Um, so it would provide a simple policy choice for nations. It would say, do we wish to investigate, recognize and maintain existing biodiversity that we have, or do we sacrifice a portion of that in order to promote industrialization? So using biodiversity, or more correctly, a knowledge of it, as a component of a commodity-based monetary system would allow ecosystem services as a subject to perform the function it was intended to do to provide an accurate and stable valuation um, of the benefits that humanity receives from the natural environment. Okay, that is me done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I've taken like two A4 pages of notes, so definitely <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> the weekends. Um, I think that was really interesting. I especially love, um, yeah, this idea of biodiversity becoming the value instead of becoming what is valued. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I also love that we've got a lot of engagement over the chat. I can see that some people also started threads. I know that's really cool. I do encourage you to engage with each other. Um, yeah, um, if you have some questions, do add them on the Q&A and we'll start going. So the way that's going to go is that um, to create a bit more interaction, I will pick the questions. So in the Q&A box, you have a function that's upvoting. Give, give it a thumb up. And this way you can indicate us which of the questions in the Q&A you'd like most to see answered. All right. So I'm going to leave you to um, use that function and I'm going to go over the questions with the most upvoting. I will also um, just read out the name of the person who posted the question and enable you to unmute yourself to ask the question yourself, if you are okay with that. If you are not, just say nothing and um, either me or Eric will uh, read out the question for you. All right, and we'll get going. So, <laughs> so the first one is called Anonymous Attendee. Would you like to ask your question? If you give me a second, I will... Anonymous. Um, no, actually, we can't because you're anonymous. Sorry about that. So I will now read the question uh, to Steve. Which is the ultimate goal of the system you propose? Money and capitalist economy stability or preserving biodiversity at the same time? Which one is the priority? They would both be um, impossibly interlinked in that system. Um, so yes, both, um, because they would be in, inter so intertwined because the biodiversity would be the foundation of the capitalism which developed from it. So um, yeah, uh, that, that's, there, there is no preference. It, it's seen, um, it would be a natural system. I wouldn't be, wanting, I, I think it would take the desire out of it. The way, the way I see it is, if you look at the, the gold in Fort Knox, 
and you look at the way that that is protected by the state. And if you thought that is the found or was the foundation of money, and if you take an, a biodiversity in a nation and you treated it in the same way as the gold in Fort Knox was being treated, I don't think you would have a problem about worrying about lack, loss of biodiversity anymore. Um, and the money that was created could be used for capitalism, but those capitalists would have to tread very, very lightly on the planet um, with greater awareness. In, in my experience, you, I've seen um, companies who've wanted to develop quickly because they've got a loan and they need to pay interest. And in order to pay the interest on the loan, they need to do the development quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, it would create a more circumspect, slower, more careful capitalism because no nation would want to develop an area without being absolutely sure that it wasn't containing millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of biodiversity. So it would slow the system up. I'm sorry about that if you want rapid development, um, but it would ensure that it was truly sustainable. That's my answer. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for engaging with that. Um, for the next question, I will unmute you, um, Zoe Allen, to ask your question. So if you wish to speak, please tell us where you're calling from and then ask a question. Um, yeah, there you go. Mm. Oh, all right, no worries. I will read out the question for you then. So Zoe is asking, wouldn't this create an incentive to lie about a country's biodiversity? Um, yes, but <laughs> um, yes, it would. Um, you would be very tempted, but um, there is uh, a scientific community of taxonomists, and, and biologists, you wouldn't just be able to come up with something off the top of your head, like a, a new purple winged ostrich um, or whatever, and say, there you go, there's one that I found. You would have to A, provide some evidence, and B, have some kind of um, confirmation, rather like gold, again, going back to gold, is at the moment it's assayed, it's marked, it's measured, it's audited. Um, you would have a similar kind of system, but not based on metallurgy, based on biology. Um, so yes, there would be an incentive, but there would have to be checks and balances obviously put in place to, to prevent fraud in that way. So would you like to respond to that? I don't think she wanted to unmute herself, so I will just go on. Perfect. Uh, the next question would be from Alejandro Argumedo. I'm going to un um, unmute you now, um, and you can ask your question. Eric, do you want to read out the question? Sure. Um, indigenous peoples living in biodiversity rich areas do not believe that nature has monetary value. Mother Earth is sacred. Economic valuation of ecosystem services is akin to commodifying the sacred. Ecosystem services theory is another Western colonialist trick to justify plunder of indigenous peoples' lands and resources using so called green tools, such as a payment for ecosystem services. RE double D, protected areas, nature based solutions, etc., promoted by Northern bingos, banks, and mining and oil companies. It certainly has that danger, and it certainly could go in that direction. Um, one of the main vehicles for taking it in that direction is the valuations being based 
on a fiat currency. Um, I think that's an important thing to understand is that we're not considering um, ecosystem services as having value. We're considering ecosystem services as actually being value in this system. Um, the, the sacred element is, is important and it is, is something which is very difficult um, to um, draw out and certainly you can't apply economic rules to that. Um, in terms of the Western colonialist trick, what I'm suggesting is, is quite the opposite. What I'm suggesting is that um, there is no other ownership of the land. Um, you cannot take, you can't, unlike gold or silver or diamonds or other mineral assets or wealth, you cannot extract it, refine it and remove it from the system where it is. And I think a lot of people would understand that if you have biodiversity, it remains where it is and it has to remain where it is. It can't be moved, it can't be stolen. Um, but the wealth which it represents can only be recognized through obtaining the knowledge of it. If you want to leave it and keep it, as an unknown, this system would work perfectly well because you could have an area which was considered sacred. Nobody in there would be economically um, capable of destroying it because of the potential for things there. Governments would be much more reluctant to allow that kind of destruction to occur because they would see that the potential value of keeping it as biodiversity um, was greater than the potential value of destroying it. Um, and what would also happen um, was it would remain an unrealized asset. It would be in effect the same as gold deposits sitting in the ground and there would be no problem with that. It wouldn't financially benefit but there would also be less of an incentive to destroy it. It would just sit and be. I think that answers the question. Yes, um, you've actually received a good feedback on your answer over the chat, so <laughs> I think it really does. Thank you so much for answering that. That was quite a challenging question as well. Um, for the next question, um, I will, um, we will take Noyonika Becky's question. I'm sorry if I bet you your name there. You may not talk if you want to. Hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, so this was sort of uh, touched upon in the last thing. Um, so my question was, many communities don't believe that a monetary value can be attached to biodiversity assets. Um, I wanted to know your thoughts on um, how, how should we work around this? Like, how do we keep the larger goal of keeping biodiversity safe and protected at the very top? Um, basically try to keep this sustainable mindset all the way through because in my mind, um, corruption is like everywhere. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I have this, I'm very suspicious of um, governments and stuff. That's, that's fine. <laughs> I, I think um, at a, a, a national level, uh, I, I see your point. I think it, considering it has to be um, a global recognition of, of an acceptance of wealth. Once it's global, you have the problem that that global acceptance is, is through government and through governmental action. Um, the, the good thing in terms of it, if you have greedy, corrupt governments, <laughs> and they want to exploit this idea, they have to do two things. One is they have to educate people and train people to identify the biodiversity. And secondly, once they've identified it, they have to keep it in place and prove that it's still there once every 10 years. Otherwise, 
it's it's gone so in a way it's rather like something that it, it, it's valuable but if you try and own it it's like dust through your fingers it collapses what you have to do is to accept and appreciate that it is only of value when it's active alive and living in that environment does that answer the question i don't know absolutely thank you so much okay come up with follow-up questions if you want to and if not we'll move on uh, no thank you so much all right um eric would you like to go for the next one Certainly. So the next one is from Kritishnu Sanyal. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. I'm going to unmute you now. Okay, uh, that's absolutely... N oh, have you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So my question is, do you think that we should consider this biodiversity as a separate category? Because in the present provision of ease of ecosystem service valuation, we don't have any kind of buffer value attached to the ecosystem, to the biodiversity is yet unknown. So do you keep it as a separate category? That's a very good question. And it was something that as, as a biologist, when I first started reading about ecosystem services, I thought, of course, biodiversity should be an ecosystem service. Um, but on reflection and over a, a, a substantial amount of time, I've come to realize that actually biodiversity is best served by not being an ecosystem service. And the reason for that is if you can, um, the, the purpose of ecosystem services is to be valued. Um, and if biodiversity was an ecosystem service, it too would fall into a valuation system. So it wouldn't be available to act as that monetary commodity that, that I think offers the, the, the best way forward. So in, instinctively, as a biologist, yes, um, thinking about it and having come up with uh, the thought of, of, of commodity-based money based on biodiversity, no, that's, that's how I feel. Thank you so much for answering that um, as well. Um, the next questions will go to Nilam Memud. You are now allowed to talk if you wish to. Nope, I will read the question then. So Neelam is saying, under this progress system, who would bear the cost of registering species? And if it's the nations themselves, how would the issue of richer nations, nations being able to register more species be resolved? That's a very good question. Um, the, the registration of species would be borne by the nation um, or by institutions with an intellectual interest in the subject. Um, but richer nations being able to register more species um, would, would own, it would only work if richer nations had more species within their nation to register. And the way that biodiversity is distributed about the globe, there is um, a concentration, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking on very limited knowledge of biodiversity, 1.6 million versus 8 million unknown. It appears that most of um, the biodiversity that's likely to be found will occur um, around the tropics and in those areas which have been least um, studied. So the Southern Hemisphere, the tropics, and from an ecologist's point of view, I would suspect remote islands would likely yield um, endemic species, which would be worth a lot to an island economy if people looked for them. Um, now, if a government or a company even wanted to go and mine another nation's biodiversity, 
I'm guessing they would have to pay and they would receive a proportion of the money coming back um, from registration of it. But the one thing they wouldn't be able to do, and that's key, is take the biodiversity away. They wouldn't be able to move it to where they were. They wouldn't be able to move it to another nation. It would have to stay where it was. And that's the nature of living things. That's the nature of biodiversity. Okay. Eric, would you like to go next? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you also for the enlightening answer. So the next question is from Tamujin Dikina. Um, I'm from South, um, sort of like I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question now. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hello? Yes, Hello. go ahead. Um, sorry, always got to check. Um, okay, um, firstly, thank you, Steve, for your presentation. It's been really interesting to listen to. Um, so I'm from South Africa and we have a lot of poverty. So, you know, large impoverished communities um, in places where more biodiversity could be discovered. So for instance, like um, small scale fishing communities, which are near marine protected areas. Um, so my, mar like my worry with this sort of like alternative value of money would be that um, it would kind of bring about a trade off between impoverished people and the environment or there would be a focus placed on the environment by the government to the detriment of people um, who are in poverty. So by instance, just kind of kicking them off land that they've been living on um, mm. to discover more biodiversity or just to, I don't know, um, implement better conservation or something. So how would you say we could sidestep that? Thank you. That, that is a, a very difficult issue. Um, and yeah, it's a very, very good question. I don't have the answers to that. What I would say is that there would have to be some kind of understanding from a government that if there was biodiversity at the moment, it was coexisting with the people who were living there at the moment. Um, they're not the threat to biodiversity and also that the hope I mean South Africa is an incredibly biodiverse country um, hopefully the, the wealth that that would generate would help to alleviate some of that poverty I really would hope and pray that that was the case um, but also it would make people more cognizant of um, the environment just closing an area off isn't necessarily going to protect its biodiversity I and mean, this leads on to the issues of, of property rights and so on which are um, beyond my purview should we say but it is a very i mean that is a, a very very significant issue which does need to be addressed um under this this kind of paradigm definitely it's a very good question i'm sorry i don't have a a, a good answer to that one. Thank you. Um, Tamsin, you're welcome to go with a follow-up question if you'd like, and if not, we'll move on uh, to the next question. All right, well, we'll move on then. Um, we, all right. we actually have a comment here um, from Beatrice. Peop should people be considered part of diversity as well? <laughs> yes, that's a very, very good question. I mean, not only um, that there is a big toing and throwing, are we part of the natural world or not? Um, are we doing things to the natural world or are we part of a whole? That's, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, in terms of, of registering yourself, as a human being, no, I don't think that's really the the general idea. Um, interesting, though. <laughs> but but no, I, I I think under these circumstances, what we're talking about would exclude um, humanity as part of, of of the biodiversity that I'm talking about. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the person question surprised me as well. <laughs> um, Natalie, Natalie Al Ziyud, would you like to go next? You can now unmute yourself if you want to. There is. I'll take the question then. 
So naturally saying, excellent and thought provoking. What would stop dominant nations from displacing populations who are living on biodiverse areas? Which I guess actually we covered a little bit. We um, that's, yes, again, that's that very good question of what would happen. Um, and again, I would say that a population living in a biodiverse area is not a threat to the biodiversity of that area. Um, you, can't, you can't move the biodiversity. So I see the point about displacing populations from it. Um, I, th I think that is a matter of, of increasing government's understanding. I think what's happened so far in terms of conservation is there has been a tendency towards um, protected areas. Um, and that need for protected areas has come about through um, industrialization and through the use of fiat currencies, which have um, encouraged speculative land use changes. It doesn't really, once you've got the loan in your pocket, it doesn't really matter what happens if the factory gets built and it doesn't actually produce anything. Um, you've, you've had the money and you've done the damage. Whereas if um, a population is living sustainably in a biodiverse area, it, it's, it's just living, it's existing, it's not doing those kind of things. Therefore, the need to protect areas in such a, a paranoid way would hopefully decline and people would understand that just continuous sustainable living would be also sustainable for the source of their wealth, which was the biodiversity underlying it. But yes, I can imagine situations where that is a significant concern. Would you like to follow up, Natalie, on that? I don't think so. Eric, would you like to go with the next question? Most certainly. Thank you very much. So the next question is by an anonymous attendee, so we can't unmute them. Um, if we see biodiversity as a commodity, isn't there a problem that biodiversity becomes as substitutable with other commodities because of the definition of commodities and markets? Wouldn't it promote further inaction about the ecological crisis due to belief in technology? If we saw, yes and no. <laughs> if we see biodiversity as a commodity, pure and simple, and that was one of the things that I, I mentioned in my talk as a potential danger, the commoditization of biodiversity and it's, it's, it's opening up on the trading markets. Yes, that's a danger. As um, a fundamental commodity upon which a, finance, a money was based, then no, because it would be what it is. Um, you wouldn't be able to exchange it for anything else because it would be money in itself. If that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, uh, Susan Evans. I will enable you to talk and if you'd like... Oh. Okay, maybe she is not in the conversation anymore. I will still ask a question because it's quite interesting. <laughs> um, she, she's asking, has any detailed modeling been carried out on how this would affect developing or industrialized economies? It seems like quite complex system thinking would be needed to try to scope out the impacts and incentives created. Um, no, no detailed modeling has been done. Um, and yes, there would be complex very complex and i think it would be a fascinating thing for somebody to do susan <laughs> if you're capable please please do it <laughs> that's that's a nice answer there you go if you're young and looking for a job you're sorted um eric absolutely so so is uh, Zoe Allen. I'm going to unmute you now. Oh, no, I think uh, we can't have tried earlier. Oh, but... yes. Uh, yes, uh, because you use an older version of Zoom, apparently. Okay, so I'm going to try to answer the question. 
would uh, um, read out the question. Wouldn't this benefit countries that can invest more into studying ecosystems? Yes, it would. It would initially um, benefit countries with the traditional um, expertise in taxonomy. Um, and those tend to be the US, Northwestern Europe, the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, sorry, uh, and China. They have um, probably the most taxonomic expertise, but it needs to be borne in mind that that taxonomic expertise, when applied to another nation, benefits the other nation, not the nation providing the taxonomist. Therefore, there would be a transfer um, both of, of wealth and of skills. One would hope that a nation would encourage um, its own people to develop the taxonomic skills required um, to, to begin to generate this kind of wealth. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the, question, the next question is anonymous as well, so I will read it out. Is the lack of knowledge about diversity a consequence of the vision of nature as an economic income and not as an income to human life quality? And how could that be changed if so? I don't think so. I, th I think our lack of current lack of knowledge about diversity um, comes because we are so intimately related um, with the natural environment. If you look at the difference in rhetoric between um, people who speak about the natural environment, who say there are millions of species, it's far too complicated, let's just treat it as a black box. And you compare that with astronomers who are extremely concerned about identifying every star, the properties of planets around stars, calculating and finding out as much as they can continuously. And I think the reason for that is psychological in that when you're looking at the stars, they're distant, you can't affect them, they can't affect you. So you can um, carry out that, that human need to classify, to identify and, and to obsess fundamentally um, at a distance. With ecosystems, it's far too close um, in that once you know what's there and you know how fragile it is, you start to have to, it starts to begin to affect your own behavior and it starts to affect your own attitudes and your own viewpoints. And I think that's why um, we have this almost ignorance is bliss approach to the natural world. That's a thought-provoking <laughs> answer, I find, but it's good sometimes to, yeah, to be very critical on things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and Tara Mandel, I will now enable you to talk. Would you like to ask your question yourself? No worries, I will ask it then. Um, and Tara is asking, how will the biodiversity backed money solve the issue of extreme wealth and income disparity? That is, if it can. I, I don't, I didn't envisage it actually addressing the issue of, of wealth and income disparity. On a global level, I think it has the potential um, because countries with higher biodiversity would be able would have the right to generate more wealth and going back to previous um, issues with regard to government one would hope that governments would see fit to raise the standard of living of the people living within such nations um, but in terms of an economic mechanism to um, address wealth and income disparity, it, well, it's not really for that. Once the money is generated, where it goes and what it's used for um, is really up to the individuals involved. 
that's, that's my answer to that one. And I think following on the same topic, I'm going to take another question uh, from um, Lea Goubil, who's asking, um, are there not countries or part of the world that are going to be disadvantaged by the fact that they're not home, or that they are home to a weaker biodiversity? Yes, there will be um, disadvantages. Um, but um, it, it offers another opportunity. It's not the great equaliser. It, it's a means, fundamentally, it's a means of it's putting the biodiversity first. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> um, and, and if you happen to, I mean, people in extreme northern latitudes are going to have to look very hard to find the full biodiversity resource in terms of un previously unrecognized species. I mean, even in the UK, every now and then, new species are found just incidentally by amateur enthusiasts or semi-professional or professionals. Um, so there are things out there which haven't been described before, even in the, a country as industrialized and as climatically disadvantaged as the UK. So it's a matter of you take what you've got. It's, I mean, it's like in the past, you, you could be living on top of a gold mine, you could be living in a swamp. It's, it's just the way it is, unfortunately. Okay, that's, that's that one. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we would not be able to answer all the questions that we have. <laughs> so everyone, please do upvote the questions that you'd most like to see answered. And Eric, would you like to ask the next question? Absolutely. Uh, the next one is from Catherine Davis, um, which you, I'm going to unmute you now. Uh, so let's have a look. That's okay then as well. I'm going to read out your question. Would the repayment of debt through describing biodiversity be similar to what the Seychelles did with a sovereign blue bond? and more akin to Charles Einstein, Eisenstein's suggestion of bailing out based on debt, not credit. The latter of often being what happens in financial crashes, i.e. the bailing out of large organizations, banks by the state, or none of these. So for context, you mentioned that in 2008, the Seychelles were the second most indebted country in the world, and they made a debt swap once they'd woken up to the fact that Seychelles is a large ocean state um, which is the way of Pacific Islands are increasingly seeing themselves. So the ocean in between them is the size of Africa and oceans can uh, sequestrate more carbon than forests. So Seychelles are surrounded by the ocean 3,000 times bigger than the land it inhabit. Right. Um, no, it wouldn't. All debt repayments and debt balancing and, and such things which are going on at the moment are still all based on the fiat currency system. Um, so the repayment of debt through um, sovereign bonds, issuing a bond, you have to have a purchaser and that money comes from other, other areas. Um, it's, it's not a matter of paying off debt as actually having the debt recognized as wealth and offset by wealth rather than offset by um, paying it off. It's, it's, it's the wealth that's generated within the biodiversity or that's recognized within the biodiversity of a nation that would automatically take that debt away. Some indebted nations in a, in a sorry state with, with a large debt, no biodiversity, and no industry um, would struggle, undoubtedly, under this situation. Um, but it, it, it's not a matter of paying off debts so much as generating wealth within a nation on the basis of its biodiversity. Also, what comes to mind when you think about the ocean 3,000 3, times bigger than the, the land that they inhabit is who's responsible for registering and conserving um, biodiversity within um, international waters? That is a good question. I think there would have to be um, some form 
of, of agreement as to how that was done. Whether there was a global pool of wealth which, because I mean, yes, deep oceans are incredibly biodiverse and incredibly poorly known. So it would be an international effort, I would imagine. And it would be, to a certain extent, I think there would have to be some form of investment in doing that, in that people would buy a bond, a nation would buy a bond or some form of um, so they would put the infrastructure in for the submersibles, for the rather like space exploration. Um, there's a big investment in getting to understand that biodiversity and it would be repaid through the creation of the wealth. I don't, I mean, ownership of international waters obviously is, is, is not, not, uh, not an option. Um, I would hope not anyway. So some kind of collaborative approach, rather like with the Antarctic. Maybe. Yeah, I, I was wondering about international land as well, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So the next question is from Pooja De Volker. Um I'm not sure whether I pronounced it correctly. Would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, so uh, my question was basically to try and understand whether um, such a system would incentivize and ensure that the rare species remain rare and don't really increase in population because in the context of India, I see that is something that would happen considering we have high land density um, and we have high population density on land and um, it's, it's something that would be very difficult to manage. Hmm. That's, that's again, a very good point. I mean, the, in, the incentive to, it, it, it's not a matter of whether something is rare or common and is increased, I mean, we cannot increase the populations of all species. Um, this is, this is the, the kind of the myth of, of financial growth. Um, some things are rare for a reason. Um, what we need to do is to understand why they're rare and to provide them with a sustainable environment. Not all rare species can increase to become less rare because of particular restrictions. If you have, um, say here in the UK, in North Wales, there is a very rare beetle that lives on top of a mountain. You can't create another mountain top for it to exist on. It has a limited habitat. So in that respect, that, that is outside of our ability to do. But I, and I can see your point, um, perhaps nations, where you have an area of border, I mean, uh, this is just, just messing around here in my mind. If you had an area of, of, of land that crossed the border, you would want, and there was a, a species which only occurred in that area of land, there could be some kind of disputes or a desire to have more in your half than in your neighbouring country's half, depending on the relationship between neighbouring countries. Um, but you can't influence what goes on over the border. You would only be able to influence what went on on your side of the border. So short of having people trying to attract things in, um, I, I think it would just work as a, a, on a natural basis. Um, I don't think it would actually be an incentive to keep things rare. Things would stay rare if they were naturally so. Would you like to follow that up, Puma? I, I think not. Um, just one thing. Where is the baseline? Where do you draw the baseline of countries? Would that be the UN um, list of countries? Because again, then disputed territories might be quite highly a, a, a dynamite, you know, a landmine, a landfill, a landmine field, basically. Yes. Um, I, I would leave that to diplomats and politicians, I'm afraid. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really good diplomatic answer, that's all right. <laughs> Lena, um, would you like to do the next one? 
I will. Uh, next one is anonymous again, so can't unmute. Um, it's a very topical question about externalization. So I feel that maybe rich countries could maybe improve their biodiversity on their own land on the cost of biodiversity in poor countries, for example, by moving dirty industries to global south or exporting their waste there, like it is actually already happening. I, yes, but under this change of circumstances, your rich country, um, you wouldn't have poor biodiverse rich countries. A, a country with rich biodiversity would by definition be wealthy. And a rich country with low biodiversity, unless it was incredibly productive and industrialized, would become relatively poorer. So that um, disparity would only be transient at the most um, because the poor victim countries as we could consider them now wouldn't be in 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 pretty short order um, they would have they would be generating biodiversity wealth at a rapid rate so they could say we don't want the rubbish anymore keep it to yourself with with um, substantial economic clout, so to do, rather than just saying please. Okay. I think we're only going to take a couple of questions more because time is running to an end. Um, all right, so the next question will, I think, be Zoe's again, if I remember correctly. Um, you do not want to unmute, so I will read your question. She's, she's <laughs> not here anymore. Oh, well, there you go. Um, okay, that's still a very interesting question and I do want to have the answer to that, <laughs> so we'll still read it. Have you given thought to the politics of how rich countries could be made to agree to such a system and what enforcement mechanism could be used if a rich country were to defect? Um, if, if a country wanted to defect, um, not to use its biodiversity to generate wealth, I, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be allowed to um, if they want to if a, if a nation as a whole really doesn't value its biodiversity and it's see the value i'm talking accountancy level value here not spiritual value or cultural value um, if they want to throw that wealth away i'm, I'm and as I say, it, it's, it's, it, those are political issues which, um, but yes, um, how rich countries could be made to agree. I think what would happen or what will happen, I, I wouldn't want to make anybody agree to anything, um, but I think the fiat currency system is on its last legs, seriously do. And, and I think the last few months have shown that. Um, so I think there is a need to reconsider and to rethink and everybody is saying how important the environment is if that's just lip service um maybe if they mean it then this is one way that they could actually commit to doing it okay thank you very much and i think we're going to take the last question if i'm not mistaken here in order to stay on time which is by Susan Evans, which I think has also left already, uh, but I'm going to read out her question. Is it feasible to propose that the existence of every known species could be reconfirmed every 10 years? And might the very scale of the activities required to prove this have negative impacts? Good question. Um, I, I think, I, I I would imagine it would be possible. Um, I think the activities to the negative impacts of, of reassessment would have to be looked at. Um, that, that's quite a, a very valid point, really. Um, if you have people running around looking for a particular rare beetle or rare butterfly once every 10 years, they could cause quite a lot of inadvertent damage. I, I think the, the reconfirmation element of it then there is an opportunity to bring in um, DNA sampling. Once you know what a species, once you've registered a species, 
determined it, identified it, characterized it, understand its ecology, then you can also sample its DNA. And once you have that DNA registration, you should be able to, or may be able to, identify its continued presence through the presence of its DNA in a sample. So I would imagine that that is how there would be a quick re-registration of material and their methods would have to be developed to make it as, as impact free as possible. But that is, I feel is how you could genuinely um, re-register without going through the entire tedious taxonomic process every 10 years. Yeah. Okay, I actually really like ending um, a QA day session on a technical feasibility question. <laughs> you know, it really grounds it, doesn't it? Uh, so thank you so much everyone for engaging so much. I'm sorry that we do not get to answer all the questions, but we are too short on time. Um, we do invite you, however, to pursue the conversation. Eric just shared a link to our Facebook group, which you're welcome to join. You're welcome to really exchange and engage in that because we do love to see um, conversations going on. Uh, a massive thank you to Steve Miniman for taking the time to prepare this presentation and to answer all these uh, questions, very interesting questions. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that. You're welcome, thank you. <laughs> thank you, and that was really great. So here in this slide, you can see um, Steve Miniman's book, which is called Ecosystem Services, Economics and Policy. You also will find a link in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for attending. We hope you enjoyed the session. Please check the festival program for more sessions. And um, finally, I'm going to leave the ground to Eric. Eric, would you like to tell us about your next session? Yes, I hope you can see me. I'm not sure quite. Um, well, if you if you sort of like got a, a, a taster of ecosystem services on, on of what uh, the policy implications of that and what people have been doing, especially in, in ecological and climate and environment uh, related circles, please feel free to check out tomorrow's um, first session at one o'clock BST about activism and how to do activism for better economics, amongst others with Christian Felber, Tony Naushin and Nick Breyer from 350.org, um, who are going to share a bit of the experience. And this is going to be a, a bit more sort of like diverse panel. So yes, um, uh, I hope to see you there. And thank you also very much for Steve Mudiman to take his time and, and share his thoughts on, on, on his ecosystem services. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. And we hope to see you in the rest of today's session and tomorrow for the closing of the festival. Thank you, Steve, again, and goodbye, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye.